Amen. Open up your Bibles, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And for those of y'all that were here last uh, Thursday, not, uh, the Thursday before we went out of town, I preached on Luke chapter, uh, about chapter Luke 11, 27 through like 32 or 36. May have went down to 38. Um, but man, I just kept on, and, and I read this chapter, and I read it several times while we was gone, and I'd read through it and read through it. And as you read through it, I just love seeing the building of it. Uh, because you never really understand why Jesus is saying this until you understand what he said before that. You know what I'm saying? So, so many times I'll be reading and I'm always that kind of person that goes back and says, why is he saying this? And then I'll go back and read before that. And then I'll be like, why is he saying that? And then I'll go back and I'll read before that. And then I'll say, why, why what, what led him? I know it was the spirit of God, but what was, what led him? What, what was he teaching on? What led him to say what he's saying right now? You know, because so many times when we quote the word of God, We'll quote a scripture, but we really don't know what led up to that. What was the conversation that he was having with the people that led up to that? You know what I'm saying? What was he, what was he talking about, John, that, that would cause him to say this right here? You know, and I love finding that in the Word of God. So as I, as I was reading this, I know I preached on uh, uh, the middle part of this uh, uh, a week ago, over a week ago. But, man, I just kept on backing up to the previous verse and backing up. I'd say, why did he say that? Well, why did he, why did he say that? And, and, and why did he say that? So as we go through here, what Jesus is starting out with in John chapter 11, he's talking about prayer. Amen? He's talking about prayer. Leading up, and, and so as we talk about prayer, okay, I'm going to go through 11. I'm going to try to hit this whole chapter today uh, and, uh, and highlight it. And what Jesus is saying and what he's talking about through Luke chapter 11 and why he is saying what it is that he's saying now in this part as we go along. Amen. So, Father, I thank you for your word. It's alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. And, Father God, I just pray that you give me the ability by your spirit to speak this word, that it be a timely word in the right season for this body, that it be anointed by the Holy Ghost, that you give me a way to explain it that's easily understood. And not only that, Lord God, but that you anoint the people to receive what he's saying and that they see it in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, let's start out in uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass that he was praying in a certain place, when he, se when a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, when I read that, my mind goes right here. Okay, I mean, you're talking, Ronnie, to, to, to the creator of the universe, according to John chapter 1, right? And I mean, just, just think about this. I mean, I mean you're, the disciples are coming to the creator of the universe, and, and it's almost like they're saying something to him that John had the ability to teach his disciples something that he hadn't even taught them yet. He says, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray. And when I say that, I'm like, you're talking to Jesus. You know what I mean? You're talking to Jesus. And you're telling Jesus to teach you like this man that Jesus made taught you. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just coming to him. So, so they're saying, they're saying, they're saying, teach us to pray like John has taught his disciples to pray. Amen. So as we go on here, and the Lord teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, I want to go over to Matthew chapter 6, and I want to look at this prayer. Okay? Matthew chapter 6 is Jesus is teaching them how to pray. And in Matthew chapter 6, he says right here, uh, 6 verse 9, he says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven. That's why Jesus tells people, listen, you don't call nobody on earth Father. You got one Father. What's his name? It's Father God. Amen. All these folks that are running around, I know we got, you know, all these people that run around, Father so-and-so, Father this, Father that. We got one Father. Amen. His name is Jehovah God. Amen. And he tells us, I mean, you got your natural father, but I'm talking about as far as the creator. Amen. In this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That name hallowed means bringing honor, bringing glory, bringing praise, bringing worship to the name of God. Every time that we enter into prayer, we are to, we are to worship God first. We, we, need to, we need to enter into prayer honoring his name. Amen. Lifting up his name. So many times we enter into prayer with just our request, and then we end it in Jesus' name. But the Bible gives us, he tells us that when we come to him, that we are to honor his name, glorify his name, amen? Give him the honor worthy. Give him the honor that's due to his name, amen? Honor his name, exalt his name, amplify his name, lift his name up, put him, put him high. Make him high on your list to be glorified, amen? 
He should be the number one on your list. He says, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And what we've got to understand there, thy kingdom come, that means bring forth the kingdom on earth. Bring forth his kingdom. Now, how do we bring forth his kingdom on this earth? The way that we bring forth his kingdom on this earth, that's why he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen. For the kingdom of God is here. And we are to pray that, that what he says right here, hallowed be thy name. And what does he say? He says that thy kingdom come. What? Thy kingdom come to this earth. His kingdom be on this earth. How is his kingdom on this earth? How do we bring his kingdom into this earth? By the proclaiming of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. By the proclaiming and the opportunity of the word of God going forth. Amen. That's why Jesus said, repent. What? Repent. Well, how do you know when the kingdom of God is working in your life? Because it's going to bring you to repentance. Amen. That's why we must preach the gospel of repentance. Amen. We must preach the gospel of turning to turning from sin and turning to Christ. Amen. So we, we see here that Jesus is explaining. He says, hallowed be thy name. Bring honor to the name of the Lord. Thy kingdom come. Bring forth the kingdom on the earth. What? The only vaccination, and we're stuck on this word because everybody's talking about vaccination. The only vaccination for sin is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other vaccine for sin. All right? All right? Uh, uh, being a nicer person doesn't cure sin. Learning how to have better etiquette doesn't cure sin. Learning how to have better manners doesn't cure sin. Learning how to, to better, uh, better behave doesn't cure sin. Uh, behavior modification doesn't cure sin. All of these things, there's not but one thing that cures sin. What is that? And that is the proclaiming of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the heart is regenerated, he becomes a new creation created in Christ Jesus. Amen. That is the only cure for sin, which only happens through the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Amen. So he says, when you pray, hallowed be thy name, bring honor. Ask that thy kingdom come, ask that God's kingdom, ask that his word would penetrate this earth, ask that his word would penetrate the heart of men, ask that his word would renew the mind of men, ask that his word would go through and penetrate into our schools and into our businesses and into our government, ask that his word, thy kingdom come, your word go forth in this land, amen? And he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, bringing forth God's will on earth, Amen? And let me tell you something. God's will is not always going to be pleasing and pleasant. Amen? So many times we think that God's will is going to be comfortable and good. You know what? It's not always going to be that way. It's God's will that there's going to be a battle of Armageddon. Where'd y'all just go? It's God's will that there's going to be a tribulation period. It's God's will that there's going to be people locked up in prison. For proclaiming the gospel. It's God's will that there's going to be a mark of the beast. It's God's will that it's going to be so tough in those last years, Ronnie, that if he didn't shorten the years, even the elect wouldn't make it. That's all God's will. Why is that God's will? Because it separates the fakers from the makers. Amen. It, separa it separates those that are just bumping their lips from those that have had a heart change. Amen. So we pray that his will be done. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread, bringing forth daily provision. Amen. We're to pray for this. That God, not only daily provision for your needs to be met in this life, which is clothing, food, shelter, money to pay your bills, money to raise your family and all of that stuff, but also daily provision be brought forth what? Through the word of God. That Lord, that you give me today, that I feed from the word of God, that I eat from the word of God, that you not only sustain me in this natural world, but you sustain me spiritually in this natural world also. Amen. So we go through here, and then he goes on and he says, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive others. Bring forth personal forgiveness. You got any ought in your heart against somebody? You got any unforgiveness in your heart against somebody? The Bible tells us very, very clearly that how, how can we expect our Father in heaven to forgive us if we've not forgiven others? How can you expect the Father to forgive you if you're not willing to give to somebody else what you want him to give to you? Amen? So do you got any ought in your heart? And that's well, that's a tough one to work on. Because just because they're out of your memory doesn't mean that you've forgiven them. Amen? That makes sense. That's a tough one to work on. Because every single one of us, when somebody does something to us, we think that we've got a right to hold some kind of animosity toward them. Amen? And we don't. Who are we? Who, what right do we have to hold anything against anybody after what you and I have been forgiven of? We have no right. Amen? Now, he goes on and he says, he says, forgive our trespasses and we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation. That means bring forth personal freedom. Lord. 
I don't want to be, I don't want to be constantly hounded by something that's con- continually wanting to draw me away from you. I want personal freedom from it. I want personal freedom from that desire. I want personal freedom from that lust. I want personal freedom. Lord, bring forth this freedom in my life, this freedom that you brought forth in my life that has set me free from the penalty of sin. But I also want per- personal freedom from the lust and the bondage and the desires of this world that are so easily snagging a hold of me and trying to pull me another way. I want personal freedom from that. I don't want to find my joy in this world. I don't want to find my happiness in this world. I don't want to find what it is, Lord. I want my personal freedom to only come through you and through you alone. I don't want it to come through anybody else. I only want it to come through you. Isn't that right, Scott? Amen. I only want it to come through you. I want my freedom to come. I don't want to find freedom in what this world has to offer me. I want to find freedom in what your word says Christ has done for me. That's where I want to find my freedom. Amen. And he goes on and he says, deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. But bringing forth deliverance. Those of us, and, and we think that once we're born again and saved, I want to be delivered from the thoughts that I have. I want to be delivered from the inward battles that I have. I want to be delivered from the things that are going on on the inside of me that nobody else knows that is going on on the inside of me. I want to be delivered from those things. Because so many times we think that once we're born again and saved that you still don't have that battle. Come on, church, let's get real. Christians have battles and struggles. And I want God. Who's he talking to? He's talking to believers. He's talking to his disciples. He's saying, teach us how to pray. People that ain't saved don't pray. Amen. So he said, they're saying, Lord, deliver me from this evil. Deliver me from this temptation. Deliver me from this desire. Lord, let not this world sink its hooks in me. That's how Jesus is teaching them to pray. Amen. Let's go back to Luke. It's just a quick snippet on that, all right? And he said unto them, when you pray, to our Father. Let's go down to verse 5. And he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. Now, what is he talking about right here? Now, you got to remember that he's teaching the disciples about prayer. The disciples just asked him, they said, now, Jesus, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray. And Jesus says, all right, he goes through the prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. All right, he goes through it. And then the next thing that Jesus says in Luke 11, he says right here, he says, uh, he says, and he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, uh, lend me three loaves of bread. So he's going right into, now he's giving an example. Now he's painting a picture of what he just taught them. He said, you go to the Father, and this is how you pray. But he says, now this is how you pray, but he says, I want you to understand something. He says, I want you to understand about being diligent in prayer. I want you to understand about continue, continues entering into prayer. You don't just pray this prayer one time. And so many people use the excuse because they don't have the understanding of the Word of God. And they say, well, I don't want to ask over and over again. That's not what that's talking about. All right? Because Jesus is giving an example right here about what it means to be persistent and to be diligent in prayer. I believe that many people that are not persistent and diligent in prayer, that that not wanting to repeat themselves is an excuse for not praying. Amen. And you think you're being obedient to the word of God, but it's a false sense of humility. Amen. Because Jesus teaches something completely opposite right here. All right. Now, Jesus, he goes on right here and he says, what if a friend, uh, he says uh, at midnight, in other words, unto him and a friend. Now, why does he come at midnight? Why does he come at midnight? Because at midnight, you got to understand back in these days that all the kids didn't have separate bedrooms like we like them to have today. All right. The kids either all slept in one room or they all slept in there, had one big room or whatever it was. They all slept in the same place. And at midnight, most folks are asleep and in bed. All right. So what he's saying, if a friend comes by at midnight and has three loaves of bread, in other words, if there's a need, the proper time is to ask right then. You don't wait until it's a better time. You, you go to the Father right then. You let your request be made known right then. All right? You don't wait until you, you don't wait until Sunday. You don't wait until you get to the altar. You don't wait until you get in front of somebody in some booth. You don't wait until this. No, it don't matter what time, what hour, daylight, dark, midnight, sun up, sundown. When you see a need, you got the right to enter boldly into the throne of grace and let your request be made known right then. If you're washed in the blood of the Lamb of God. Amen. So what he's saying at midnight which is not a convenient hour, which is not a convenient time. And when somebody comes up beating it on your door at midnight, 
Everybody's going to sit straight up in bed. Everybody's going to wonder what's happening. Everybody's going to be reaching for their bat, reaching for their pistol. Who's at my house at midnight? Who's beating on my door at this time? Who's beating on my door? This is the picture that he's painting. Amen? Because he didn't say in the middle of the day. He's talking about at the most inconvenient time when everybody's asleep. But somebody recognizes there's a need. And because the need greater outweighed the comfort of the people, then he was willing to go and do what needed to be done in order for that need to be met. See, too many times we're wanting to sacrifice need for comfort. So we'll let somebody go and be in need in order to keep the situation comfortable. Okay, does that make sense to everybody, all right? So he goes on here and he says, for a friend of mine, now the guy is beating on the door, he says, for a friend of mine, all right, so this is a guy going and beating on the door, is it for himself? No, it's for somebody in need. It's for a friend of his that is in need. A friend of his has showed up at his house and he needs something and this guy does not have the ability to give it. All right? So now look here. He says, for a friend of mine is, uh, uh, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. In other words, a friend on his journey has come before, come to this guy's house, all right? And he has no food to give him, no bread to give him. Nothing to give him, nothing to eat. And you know what the amazing thing is? He doesn't tell him going over and lay down and, and, and he'll get up in the morning and see about getting something rounded up. No, because the need was right then. It moved the man to move right then in order to meet the need. That's what James said. He said, if you see a brother in need and you got the ability to help him and you tell him I'm praying for you and going about your way, you ain't done nothing at all. Don't sit there and pat yourself on your back. He says, if you see a brother in need and you got the ability to meet it and you say you're going to pray for him and then move on, don't be bragging about how close you are to God and serving people. Amen. So he sits there. This guy has got a need. He's hungry. He's at his house. He comes. This man has nothing to give him. He has no bread, nothing to give him, no food to give him. So what does he do? He is moved right then to go and meet that need. Amen. Now let's look here. And he says, And I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, in other words, he's yelling through the door. He says, hey, boom, boom, boom. God's waking up. I mean, you got to get this picture in your head. Wah, 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 wah. He's looking, making sure the kids are okay. Make sure everything's okay. Make sure the wife is okay. You know how you are somebody beat. You ever had somebody come beating on your door in the middle of the night? All right. I mean, you up, you you ready to defend. I mean, that's one time you go answer the door with your pistol in your hand. Right? That's right. I mean, you go and answer, and, and all of a sudden, this guy, and he says, he's telling me, he says, hey, hey, everybody's already asleep. Everybody's already in bed. Now, listen to this. He's beating on the door and tells you, he says, hey, listen. Boom, boom, boom. What, 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 what? Listen, a friend of mine who's been on a journey just come to my house, and I don't have nothing to feed him. I need some food. I need you to give me something to feed this guy because I don't have nothing to give to him. Okay? Now, watch. And from within, in other words, and from within, in other words, he ain't answered the door. He didn't come and open the door. Amen. Shall answer and say, trouble me not. In other words, let me put it in today's dialect. Leave me alone. All right? Leave me alone. Trouble me not. The door is now shut. Leave me alone. The door is now shut. Leave me alone. I'm asleep. Leave me alone. I'm in bed. Leave me alone. Go to the store. Leave me alone. There's a convenience store down on the corner. Go down there and buy it. Go get your job so you can have the food in your house that you need. Okay? He says, leave me alone. The door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. In other words, my children's in bed. My wife's in bed. The food's put up. The stove is turned off. The microwave is shut down. Everybody sleep. I ain't got time to jack with you right now. All right? And I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is a friend, yet because of his importunity, not inopportunity, importunity. You know what that word importunity means? I wrote it right right here. Persistence to the point of annoying. Hey, 
I need something to eat. A friend of mine just showed up at the house. Are you awake yet? Hey. Hey, Sean. What? Hey, I got a buddy of mine just showed up at the house. He's been on a long journey, and I ain't got no food to give to him or anything. I need something to eat. Hey, 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 be quiet. My kids are in bed. You're going to wake everybody up. Not realizing that him yelling loud enough to go back through the door and through the wall, that's the very thing that's probably waking the kids up. Amen. He says, everything's put up. This guy says, no, hey. He's like, maybe you didn't hear me, okay? Hey, I need some food. This guy, hey, hey, maybe you didn't hear me. Hey, I need something. Listen, it's going to be easier if you just give it to me instead of me sitting here doing this all night. Because I ain't leaving. I ain't going away. I know you've got the ability to meet my need up inside there. I'm not giving up. I'm not backing down. I'm not stopping. So finally, the guy just gets up and he says, goodness. And he probably got more than what he originally needed because that guy didn't want him to come back. Now, what is it? What is the Lord doing? He's teaching something about prayer here, right? Because this guy was persistent until the point of annoying the guy on the inside. All right? Now, what does it say? Let's see here. And he says, trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, his persistence to the point of annoying the guy inside the house, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. He said, because the guy wouldn't stop. The guy wouldn't now. Then you got to understand this is the will of the Lord. Why is this the will of the Lord? Because the Lord is very, very clear to us, all right, uh, uh, through the story of the Good Samaritan, through the book of James, through our, through the book of Acts about being hospitable, about the Good Samaritan taking care of those that are in need, put it on my bill. The Lord is very, very clear to us about what we are to do and how we are to treat, especially those, according to the book of Galatians, in the household of faith. Amen? So this guy's got an understanding that it is his job to be hospitable and meet the need of the one at his house. But he's also got an understanding it's a little bit further than that. He's also got an understanding that this guy inside the house of the door that he's knocking on, amen, should also know that even if I don't have the need, but you have, even if we're three people down now, right, that this guy don't have no food, I don't have no food, but part of your hospitab hosp hospitability, amen, Part of your job is if you have got a need, part of your job, according to the Word of God, if you've got the ability to meet it. So, see, once you understand the Word of God, and once you understand what the role is of a believer in the Word of God, now that will give you the, the, the confidence to stand at the door going, hey, Hey, I know you said you ain't getting up, but hey, I know right now it ain't been answered, but hey, I know right now Jesus said he ain't been healed, but I'm going to keep on knocking. I'm going to keep on praying. I'm going to keep on believing. I'm going to keep on shouting. I'm going to keep on knocking. I know I don't see nothing right now, but he need his body to be touched by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what he's saying. Not this little old limp prayer that goes, Jesus, if you got time, I'm throwing a sticky note up to you. Touch him if he can. And then I done prayed about it. No, for this guy's need to get met, check this out. Derek, he had to get up. He had to get dressed and go search out a need or the ability to meet a need that wasn't even for him. Sometimes there's going to be people in your life that may not have the strength to pray for themselves and they may be dependent upon your prayer in order to strengthen them and get them to where they need to be. Amen. All right, let's look here. And he says, and he says, and rise, and I say unto you, ask. Now he goes right into this. Now Jesus, I knew what I say to you. He says, you want to learn how to pray? All right. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give me some praise. Give me some glory. Amen. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Lord, let thy kingdom come. Let your will be done. Lord, I believe it's your will to heal. 
I believe it's your will that the word of God, that the spirit of God go inside that man's body and drive out every sickness and every disease in the name of Jesus. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Let thy kingdom drive out. Let the kingdom of light drive out the kingdom of darkness. Let the kingdom of God destroy the kingdom of the enemy. Let the kingdom of your will destroy the will of the enemy and the plan of the enemy. Let your plan decimate the plan of the wicked. The kingdom of God, they, they, let him be delivered from that sickness. Let him be delivered from that bondage. Let him be delivered from that addiction. Let him be delivered from the blindness. Let him be delivered from these things. Let him be delivered from the blind spirit that's blocking them from seeing the truth of the word of God. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done. Open his eyes up in the name of Jesus Christ that he can see the truth of the gospel. Because when you understand this, it will change the way you pray. It will change the way you believe. You ain't going to be coming to God no more like just scared that he's going to strike you down with a lightning bolt. Why? Because he gives us this as example in order so that we can understand the boldness that we have through the shed blood of the Lamb and by the Spirit of God to come boldly to the throne of grace and let your request be made known. And you don't stop. You don't quit. As long as your prayer is lined up with the word of God, it is the will of God. Too many of us today, we quit knocking. Sometimes, I'm going to say this, I believe it. Somebody may put, God may put somebody in your life that you need to pray for, not because they're dependent upon you, but God's trying to teach you the importance of prayer. Amen. That makes sense? All right, let's look here. Now he goes right into it. He talks about knocking, beating, kicking the door in. Amen. And then he says, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given. That word ask means to beg, desire, to crave. See, I don't think many of us in this world today crave the things of God because we can just go to the world and get an, get an answer. Many of us don't crave a healing because we can just go to the doctor and get a shot. Many of us don't crave a renewing of the mind because we can just go to the doctor and get a pill. Many of us don't crave these things because we have got a crutch that is so close that we can lean on it so quick, amen, that, that we find no need to continue asking. And many times our excuse becomes, well, I did ask Jesus and he didn't do nothing, so I just went and got it somewhere else, which we don't say it that way. But the word is ask. He says ask. I mean, we're to beg. We're to crave. We're to desire, we're to ask, we're to beg, we're to desire. Gives a whole new meaning when it says asking for the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? It gives a whole new meaning to when it means asking for the gift of tongues, asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, asking for deliverance, asking for healing, asking that when we're to go in, because if we truly, truly desire, if we truly, truly crave, because Paul told us in the Word of God, he said that we are to desire spiritual gifts. So if we have a desire for something, we are to have no problem with going, hey, Jesus. Does that make sense? Amen? So when we sat here and he looked, he says, ask. What is it? He says, ask. Now, he don't put no time limit on that. He says, ask, be he says, ask, beg, desire, crave, and it shall be given unto you. But this has got to be the things that line up with the word of God. Just because you want it doesn't mean it's God's will. So we got to make sure that what we're asking for and what we're craving is according to God's will. And then you got to be okay if it don't happen. Okay. And then he goes on and he says, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. That word seek, you know what that word seek means? You don't stop till you find it. What if I told you in this room, somewhere in this room, whether it be under this foundation, but somewhere in this building or under this building, there's a billion dollars buried, and whoever finds it can have it. I guarantee you that if you come in here seeking one day and didn't find it in one day, but you knew that it was here, I guarantee you that you would be back the next day seeking. See, the word seek means a continual going to until you find or grab a hold of what it is that you're looking for. The word seek is a word that is continual. See, you don't ask and then stop because now you're not seeking. You don't get born again and then stop serving God 
our life, we are to be diligent. He is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. Seeking God is not a one-time born-again experience. Seeking God is an everyday decision-making thing that we do. To seek him continually. Because you know what? You're going to have to seek him about your mind being renewed. You're going to have to seek him about getting off. About, about every, I ain't going into that right now. Lord Jesus, help me. I ain't going into it right now, but I'm going to get into it in a minute. Just not right now. <laughs> All right. And he says, knock. That word knock means this right here. Where are you going back down there at that guy's house? Well, wasn't you down there yesterday? Yeah, but he didn't answer. What are you going back down there for? He might answer today. Where are you going today? Back down here to that old boy's house. Why? Well, you've just been down there the past two or three days. Why are you going back? He didn't answer. Why are you going back today? You in there? That's what he's asking. He's saying, keep on going. Knock. Knock. He's saying, ask. Ask. You got to beg. And I know there, and I know we don't like to say that, but that's what the Greek of that means. It means to beg. I know we like to sit up today holier than now. I don't have to beg. I'm not going to beg. Okay, let's say it's your loved one laying in there on the deathbed. Is that going to get through that pride finally? Would you beg for your wife, Brother Chris? I bet you did, didn't you? I bet, oh, I bet there's times you're on your face saying, God, please, please, God, whatever it takes, Lord, I'll give it up, Lord. I'll trade spots with her, Lord. Take it off of her and put it on me. Take that leukemia off of her, Lord, and put it on me. I will gladly give my life so that she can have life. And he goes on. For everyone that asks, receives. Everyone that asks. We got the promise of the Father right there. Everyone that asks receives. Everyone that begs. Everyone that craves. Everyone that desires. Now, this is where this gets blown up. Just because you're asking for a BMW. That, 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 no, I'm talking about things that line up with God's word. All right? I guarantee you, you asking to be set free, and you keep asking, you keep begging, you keep craving, you keep desiring, he's going to set you free. I, I guarantee it. I, there's not a doubt in my There's not a single doubt in my mind. Why? Because he's bound by his word. He's bound by it. All right? He goes on and he says, For everyone that asketh, receive. And he that seek, find. He that seeks, you keep seeking, you're going to find it. All right? See, if we, see, I, I remember one day right after I got saved, I'll tell you all this story. And man, right after I got saved, I had an eight ball of cocaine in my pocket the day I got saved, and I didn't throw that co cocaine away. I didn't do it right then either. But I remember one day I laid out, I don't know, I'd been saved a few days. This one of the first times I ever, ever thought I'd, another time, few, first few times I'd heard the voice of the Lord. And I laid out that big old rail. I got ready to do it. And I remember the Lord spoke to me just as plain as day, and I didn't even know it was God then. He said, imagine if you sought after me half as much as you seek after that. I said, whoa. I said, really? Imagine if we sought after God half as much as we try to come up with the answers of why he didn't do what I thought he needed to do. Imagine if we sought after God ha half as much as we do the things of this world. Imagine if we sought after God half as much if we sought the word of God half as much as we searched the world for a cure. Amen. So he goes on. He says, if you seek, you're going to find. Now look here. And he says, now, this is where he goes into verse 11. Now, listen. And if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will you give him a stone? In other words, he says, if you're, he, he starts tying it in right here. He's talking about prayer, okay? And they're asking him, saying, all right, how do we pray? He said, this is how you pray. Give, him, give the Lord some praise. Give him some glory, amen? Ask him to deliver you. Forgive others, amen? Ask him to provide for you daily, okay? But then he goes right into saying, but he says, listen, listen. It's almost like saying, if you don't see it right then, continue asking. Continue seeking. Continue knocking. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't quit. And then he says, this is why. He says, because if a son, listen, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will you give him a stone? Wait a minute. He's saying, if your son comes to you, okay, if your son comes to you and he's asking for bread, are you going to give him something when he bites it, it's going to break his teeth? No. 
He says, why? Because he knows that he needs bread to nourish his body. He knows that he needs the food in order to nourish his body, to strengthen him so he has the strength to make it through day to day. So if you and I are coming to the Father, and if I'm asking the Father that, Lord, I need strength, I need understanding of your word, I need wisdom of your word, I need knowledge of your word, and if we're asking him to seek that, do you think he's going to give us something else? Do you think he's going to give us something that's going to hurt us? Do you think he's going to give us something? No, because he knows that we need the, we need the, the nutrients from his word in order so that you and I can have the spiritual sight that we need to have in order to make it through this day-to-day -day world. All right? So many of us, I believe the reason we're not receiving that is because we're not continuing asking and we're not continuing seeking through the word of God those things. We want to get caught up in all the motions. We want to get caught up in all this stuff. We want to get caught up in doing all this stuff, but we're not getting alone with the Father asking, seeking, and knocking. Amen? And we wonder why we're not getting it. Why? Because the Bible says if you ask, you get it. If you seek, you find. If you knock, the door will be answered. He says, if you're doing that, so the reason that we're not getting the results that we want to get is because we're not doing what the Word of God tells us to do. It's that simple. If we're not getting the results, it's because we're not doing the work. There's that word, Ronnie, work. All right? So we'll go on here. Now, let's, 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 let's check it out. And he says, if he asks for bread, will Father give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish... Will he give him a serpent? In other words, when you go to bite it, is he going to give you something that's going to bite your lip and kill you? Is he going to give you something that's going to kill you? No. Now listen to this. Or if you ask for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? No. Then listen to this. If you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Now listen. Listen to this. I've heard people sit there and say, well, I'm afraid to ask for the, I've, I've literally heard people say that I'm afraid to ask for the Holy Spirit because what, what, what if something else happens? Well, then that goes to show your lack of trust in the Word of God. You're judging God. So you mean to tell me that God just told me that if I ask for the Holy Spirit, in other words, he's comparing it, he's saying, hey, listen, if a son asks for an egg, you're not going to give him a scorpion, something that can bite him and hurt him, right? If he asks for bread, you're not going to give him a stone, something that he can break his teeth on, right? If he asks for a fish, you're not going to give him something else that can hurt him, right? Okay, then why do we got all these goofy people running around that when somebody asks for the Holy Spirit or somebody asks for the gift of tongues that the Bible talks about, that they think that they're receiving another spirit? The Word of God speaks directly against that. If the Word of God tells me, Paul says, we are to desire spiritual gifts, and if I go to the Father with my born-again heart, and I'm saying, Lord God, your Word says that I'm to desire spiritual gifts, now I come to you asking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I ask for evidence of speaking in tongues. I'm asking for it, Father. Do you think he's going to give you another spirit where you're speaking in some demonic language? That people say happens? And people think that happens. No, if I'm coming to God, the proof in the Word of God is right here. That means that in the midst of asking that he's a good father, and just like I'm not going to give my daughter Bethany right here a serpent if she, Daddy, I need a sandwich. Okay, baby, I'm going to slide this serpent in here to bite you and kill you. So if I'm going to the Father and saying, Lord, I see in your word, I want the Holy Ghost, Lord. I want the Spirit of God, Lord. I want the power of God flowing through me to glorify others, Lord. The Bible tells me that I'm to desire spiritual gifts, Lord. And I know I don't understand everything, Lord, but I desire those spiritual gifts, Lord. I'm asking you to baptize me in the Holy Ghost, Father God. I'm asking you to fill me from the... You think you're going to say, hey, watch this. I'm going to mess with him a little bit. And then you give you a demonic spirit where you're speaking Satan's language. He says, if you being evil, in other words, the way that we love our children is considered evil to compare to the way that God loves us. He says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, you're not going to give them a serpent in place of a sandwich. You're not going to give them a stone in place of an egg or whatever it says. He says, if even you know how to do that. To give good gifts unto your children, how much more is the Father going to give unto you when you ask for the Holy Spirit? Get rid of that stupidity and that nonsense. Listen, the biggest attacks in Jesus' days come from so-called spiritual leaders. Amen? Amen? Spiritual leaders. All right, now let's go on here. And he goes on and he says, 
And he was casting out a devil. Now, we went through this. This is the part we went through on Sunday or on Thursday but before I left. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I want to jump over to uh, uh, verse, uh, let me see here. Uh, let's see, 27 or 26. Nope, 28, 29. And when the people were gathered together, he began to say, this evil generation, they seek a sign, and there shall be no sign given, given it but the sign Jonah the prophet. Now, he's saying right here, he says, listen, people want to see a sign. People always want to see a sign, okay? Listen, I want to see spiritual gifts happen. I want to see things happen. I want to see people get baptized in the Holy Ghost. I want to see people get healed. I want to see the lame leap. I want to see dead men, people get I want to see all that cool stuff happen. But if it doesn't happen, it does not change my belief in God. Amen? It does not happen. Because my belief is not based on what I see. I don't walk by sight. I walk by what? Faith. Amen? So that's not going to change. I want to see it happen. Uh -huh. And because I want to see it happen, that's, what's, that's what motivates us to continue praying and to continue going forth. Amen? But I, it doesn't change. If I don't see it happen, it's not going to change my belief in God. And don't let these people that don't believe in that stuff try to tell you that it doesn't happen anymore. Don't, don't, don't let these people tell you that stuff. Don't, try to tell, don't let these people try to tell you that that stopped uh, uh, with the prophets of old. Don't let people try to tell you that. Why? Because all that's going to do is kill your desire to even pray for people now. God still heals. God still saves. I've seen people get healed. I've seen blind eyes open. Amen. I've seen deaf ears open. I've seen people get out of wheelchairs. I've seen these things happen with my own eyes. Amen. I've seen it happen. God still heals. God still saves. God still baptizes in the Holy Ghost. Amen. God still does those things. All right. And if those, and, and if those gifts went away with those that were old, amen, if those gifts went away with Paul, okay, and I know we got a couple of scriptures, but if the gifts of the Spirit went away with Paul and if it was only for the disciples, then why was Paul teaching the uh, church of Corinth how to properly flow in the gifts? Amen. Which that was a bunch of Greek heathens. Amen. All right, now let's go on here. And he goes on and he says, all right, verse uh, 29. And he says, for as Jonas was assigned unto the Ninevites, so shall the son of man be of the generation, the queen of the south. So in other words, I'm not going to read all this because I did it a couple Thursdays ago. But he said, this was the sign. He said, listen, nobody but the nobody in Nineveh seen Jonah get swallowed by the whale. Or the big fish, whatever it was. Nobody in Nineveh saw that. Right? Nobody, nobody in Nineveh saw Jonah get swallowed by that big fish and then spit back out on land. None of them saw that. Jonah's trying to run from God. God sends a fish, swallows him up, takes him right back to the place he left from, spits him out on land, and now go preach the gospel. He says, go tell them to repent. Are they going to be wiped out in three days? So what does he do? He walks through the middle of the city and he starts preaching repent. And he preached the gospel. He preached repentance. Nobody got raised from the dead. Nobody got healed. There wasn't no lightning to come out of the sky. The word of God went forth and broke the hearts of people and even, even put their animals on a fast. And the city was saved from destruction. Why? Because they were blessed because they heard and believed without having to see a sign. All right? Then when we go through, and I'm not, I, I touched on that Thursday night, even the Queen Sheba, she came, why? To hear who? To hear, uh, uh, to hear Solomon and all of his wisdom. And she heard what he had to say and said that had to be God, and she repented. She come from a heathen nation. All right? So today we want to sit there and say, hey, you know what? Show me a sign. Show me a wonder. If I can see something happen, I'll believe. That's why Jesus said only an evil and a perverse generation. Why? Because Jesus right here, he just cast out a deaf and dumb spirit. The kid couldn't talk. He was deaf and dumb, couldn't talk. Jesus cast the spirit out. The kids start speaking, and then they tell Jesus, show us a sign and we'll believe. <laughs> they just sit there and see that. A sign is not going to cause you to believe. The only thing that causes a man to believe is the preaching of the gospel, breaking a hard heart. Jesus said, I've come to heal the broken of the hearted. That is why the law must be preached to break the man, and the gospel must be preached to heal the man. And he says, all right, let me go on here. Let's jump over, and I'll start finishing up. Let's jump over to verse 30. Uh, so he goes on here, and he's talking about, than the men of an enemy. So they go through and are telling Jesus, you know, that he's casting out, you know, devils by the power of the devil. And Jesus saying, no, that, that don't even make sense. A kingdom divided is not going to stand. How could Satan's kingdom divide if I'm walking around with the power of Satan kicking his own people out of the very thing that he's trying to possess? 
Amen. He said, that don't even make sense. And he said, so if I'm casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, then who's your kids? How, what are they using? All right. So it goes on here and he says, talking about the strong man right now. And he says, the men of Nineveh, and, uh, and then he says, no man, when he has lighted a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that which come in may see the light. So he says, no man, he says, when you, when you, when you light a light, you don't hide it. You light the light, why? So people can see. When people walk into this room, we turn on the lights, why? So people can see. Why? So you're not tripping around, you're not stumbling around. He says, you turn on the light so people can see. No man takes a light and lights it up and then hides it. What's the point of even lighting the light? And that's what you and I've got to understand when it comes down to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's people that are going through this world. They're stumbling around. They're falling around. They're stumbling through this world blind, uh, blind as a bat, okay? But you and I, listen, we don't get the gospel to keep it on the inside. We don't get the gospel to keep it on the inside for me and nobody else. We don't get the gospel. Don't let your flesh, don't let your body become the cover that covers the gospel. You and I don't get, get saved. It's not just for me, amen. Nobody lights a candle and puts it under a bushel. Nobody should get saved and become silent. Nobody should get saved and become silent about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he goes on. He says, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, the whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, the body is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be no darkness. Now, let's jump down to verse 38. And when the Pharisees saw it, he marveled that he had not first. So Jesus sits down and he's eating, all right? And he doesn't wash his hands. Now, check this out. And he doesn't wash his hands. And the Pharisees, they marveled. They're like, what in the world? Okay. He's not washing his hands because the Pharisees actually thought, that washing the hands could wash the demons off that lived on your hands. They thought that the water could wash these little demons off that lived on your hands. And so, in other words, they were taking the, the law and turning it into a tradition of man because the priests were to use the law when they were doing ceremonial cleansing back in Exodus chapter 19 and Exodus chapter 20, I believe it is. They would do that as a ceremonial cleansing, but it was for the priest to use whenever they was going in, getting the brazen altar and all that stuff ready. It wasn't for people. It wasn't, it wasn't to wash your hands and wash the evil off your hands before you ate. Does that make sense? So what happens is, I love the way Jesus handled this. Let, let me, let's go to a Mark 7 real quick, and we'll finish up here today. All right? And he says, then the Pharisees and the scribes ask him. So Jesus is going through, and he's talking, all right? How do we pray? Talking about this, how you pray. Ask, continue asking, continue seeking, continue knocking, because this is going to be a re result. You're going to receive, you're going to find, and the door is going to be open. Okay? So we go through, so they say, don't give up. Then Jesus turns right, right around. He heals somebody who's got a, a demon spirit. All right? The people tell him that uh, Beelzebub done it. Okay? He turns and they say, if, you know, show us a sign. And he's like sitting there. He doesn't even defend it. He's like saying, did you not just see the sign? Because when he says, do you not just see the sign, they're just going to blame it on the demon anyway. You see what I'm saying? They're going to give credit to the demon. So de Jesus doesn't even really address that. So then he just keeps on going. He goes on. The guy gets healed. The guy, the deaf and dumb spirit gets cast out of the guy. Jesus keeps on moving along. And then he goes in. Now, why is he talking about a light? He goes in, he starts talking about the light. Because what he's comparing it to is how blind these Pharisees are. He's saying they think that they got a light, but they're actually hiding the light. They think that they've got the light. They think that they've got the truth. They think that they've got understanding. But actually what they're doing is they're hiding the understanding. They're hiding the light. They're hiding the truth. They're hiding the knowledge of the truth. They're hiding that. And I believe that's what happens with many, many people today. That the Word of God teaches us things about freedom. The Word of God teaches us things about deliverance. The Word of God teaches us things about the gifts of the Spirit. The Word of God teaches us. But we get denominations out there that try to hide it, Ronnie. They try to hide it, say that doesn't exist anymore. Well, they try to hide it, say that's not around anymore. They try to hide it. Why? Because I believe that they're blind to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ themselves. They try to hide it. And you know how it is. Something that you don't understand or something that you've never experienced, you try to hide it from others. Because there's no way that you want somebody to have a knowledge that you hadn't tapped into yet. Amen? Because how's that going to make you look, preacher? Amen? All right, now he goes on. So he goes through all of this, and he's saying, then all of a sudden he gets to, uh, he gets to uh, uh, Matthew or Mark 7, and I love this. He says, the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, why, why, uh, walk, or says, why walk not thy disciples according to the traditions of the elders? Now listen, you notice right here, they didn't say, why, do you, why, why are your disciples, they say, why are they not walking according to the ways of God? He says, but to the tradition of the elders. He doesn't say, why are they not walking according to the word of God? He says, the tradition of the elders. 
Why, why are they not doing what God's word says? What he's saying is, why are they not doing what the elders say? I'll tell you what, there, all of us got that garbage right there in us. All of us. All of us got that garbage in us. I mean, you get some people out there, I'm a King James man. Huh? You get some people out there, tradition of you, you don't, don't, don't look at another version in order so that you can maybe get a little bit clearer understanding a little bit. No, it's only King James, but that's it. Everything else of the devil. No, it's not. I believe some of them are. All right? Some of them are. But you know what? I like to amplify it, too. And I got me a Bible. It's got King James down one side and amplified down the other. You got a problem with that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know what? When I look at King James and it says something like this, it says, then the Pharisee scribes asking him, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread? You know what? When it's kind of, it gets into King James, it's got a lot of these, thous, and that's, and, this, and all that. I'll slip right on over. I said, what are they trying to say? And I'll look at it. Guess what? I'll go, oh, okay, cool. Let's slide back over here now. Yeah, I got it. You got it. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no. King James. Oh, King James. Good enough for the apostle. Paul's good enough for me. And I'm a King James guy. I preach out of King James. I study King James. I do believe that King James is one of the most accurate, accurate readings out there. But that doesn't mean, according to the tradition of men, doesn't mean that I can't slide over a little bit and say, Lord, what, I need a little clearer understanding of this. Well, all them understandings, you know, if the Lord meant for you to understand it, he'd give it to you and where you can understand it. Well, if the Lord meant for you to understand it, he'd taught you how to read Greek. Right? Or Hebrew. Or Latin. That makes sense? All right? So, he goes on here and he says, according to the tradition of elders. He says, listen, walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders. And let me say something else. There is some of them out there that are thrown off. But when you slide it over and if you're comparing Scripture to Scripture, you have got to use the Spirit of God and to discern. And to, if you will study the Word out, you're not going to get caught up at, okay, is this saying what this is supposed to say? If you'll study the Word out instead of just trusting on somebody else's interpretation. Study, show thyself approved. See, here's where most of us get caught. I don't believe that. Okay, we'll study that. Why, why is it? What's different? What's different? You study it out. Study it. Educate yourself according to the Word of God. Gain some knowledge. Amen? Now, I'm not an NIV fan. I'm not out there. But there are some other good translations out there that will help you grow in the knowledge of God. All right? Not the message. Not the NIV. Amen? <laughs> All right. All right, let's go on here. And it says, he answered and said unto them, now he said, according to the tradition of elders, according to the tradition of men. In other words, they eat bread with unwashed hands. They eat bread with unwashed hands. In other words, Jesus, God told them to wash in the ceremonial cleansing, to be ceremonial cleansed. The priest, when they got ready to carry out the work in the temple, that you're to wash through the ceremonial cleansing. But now the tradition of men have brought in and say, oh, they're eating with unwashed hands. Okay, let me go on here. All right? And he go because there's much more here. This is where I really wanted to get. He answered and said unto them, well, hath Isaiah prophesied, you hypocrites, it is written, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for the doctrines, the commandments of men. So in other words, listen, this is what he's saying. He's saying, listen, he says, your, your worship is in vain. Your worship of me, because what has happened is, is you have exalted your man-made ideas above the Word of God, and you're holding them at a higher level than the Word of God, and you've become so confused that you've exalted that so high that you're not able to identify the difference. And so really what you're doing is you're worshiping an idea made by man instead of God. So really what you're worshiping is your worship to me is absolutely vain. It's zero. It means nothing. 
And so many times today we walk around and we come up with these little ideas, we come up with these little traditions, we come up with these little things, and, and that we think that really we can't prove it in the Word of God, but we come up with these things and we exalt that as yes and amen, but it's not actually in the Word of God. And we, we try to take things and put it on there and say, well, if the Word of God says this, then this is what this really means, and we can take it and adopt it over. And some things you can, and we can take it and adopt it over to here, but it's not true in every case. So many, many times we try to adopt things that make me look more holy and more righteous and more sanctified, but it's really not in the Word of God at all. And when we can't explain something, we love tying it into we are the temple. I've heard people say that people are going to hell because they smoke cigarettes. Why is that? Because they are the temple. Well, are you going to hell for being 400 pounds? And <laughs> What about 30 pounds overweight? What about 50 pounds overweight? What about, okay, you're smoking cigarettes. You love bonbons. Why is he going to hell and you ain't? Both of them bad for you? Well, I don't listen to nothing on the radio and don't talk about Jesus. But you'll watch a bunch of garbage on TV and don't talk about Jesus, huh? <laughs> I don't listen to nothing on But you'll watch stuff on TV. has got black magic and all that. Well, that's good. Cool. Yeah, Help, please help me here. I'm not. I'm missing it somewhere. Well, we shouldn't be listening. At. Okay, I'm with you. But let's go ahead and get it all away. We shouldn't be watching either. Well, we ought not be caught up. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. All of our conversations need to be godly. We need. Okay, then you need to shut up about football. Because this man right here, tell you number one, it's time idle time football. The uh, the the God of Texas or whatever he calls it, you know, Baal, yeah, foot Baal. That's what he calls it, foot Baal. <laughs> and, you know, so we, so what we do? Am I making sense here? How we come up with these things that make me look more self righteous, but I'm not really using the same sword to cut what I'm doing as I am to cut somebody else and what they're doing. Traditions of men. <laughs> What'd you call it? Say that again. <laughs> so, but it's very, and, and I don't think we do that on purpose. I don't think. Amen. So by no way am I sitting here saying, oh, it's okay for us to go out and listen to whatever we want to do and do whatever it is that we want to do. No, I'm not saying that at all. Amen. Amen. But. I'm, I'm telling just because, listen, if somebody's coming in, amen, and it don't fit your brain, amen, on what it is that you to Paul thought about that in Corinthians also. We'll go into that later. Amen. But how quick we are to grab a hold of a tradition or something that we think, you know, we'll sit there, no cussing. I see people do it on Facebook all the time. Check this out. Everyone's going to blow your mind <laughs> amongst us brothers in here and sisters. I don't want to listen to that. Got filth. Then they'll send you a text saying, got some strong language in it, but this one's okay to watch. Why? Because it's got a good message behind it. It weren't me. You said it weren't me. <laughs> well, nobody in here. <laughs> it weren't me. <laughs> Guilt and condemnation will always find you out. <laughs> I repent, Jesus. Just so you know, Jesus, that wasn't me. <laughs> that one, all them other ones he was talking about, yes, yes, but that one weren't me. <laughs> so, so what we do is we come up with these things, amen. And really, that's what I believe that's what the Lord's saying when he's saying we got to look at the speck in our own eye or the log in our own eye before we look at the Speck in somebody else's eye. Amen. Now, does that mean that we do away with the judging of self? No. But I know if I'm looking at something, I'm coming to Bethany. I mean, there's some there there there's times I'll hear Bethany 
say stuff or why then not, I'm just using Bethany example, but uh, especially your kids, you'll hear them say stuff or you'll see them do something and you want to correct that so bad, but you know why you hear yourself coming out of their mouth. Ugh. I'm like, I need to correct her on that, but who really needs to be corrected? Until we let that sword cut us. So the sword I was about to fling on her, guess what? That's that double-edged sword. It just got turned on me. Because I just heard, you know why? Because the Holy Spirit would be right there to say, hold on. Hold on. That's you coming out of her mouth. So, I don't know, that stuff just speaks to me. Speaks to me so loud. My wife, who is the Holy Spirit in flesh. Oh, look here, you turn into stone sometimes. All right, I know she got snakes in her hair, but I ain't even looking at her right now. Cause she'd be sitting going. All right, let me finish up here. And it says, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. See, so many times that we get so quick to want somebody else to know that I'm a Christian, and we're so quick to enforce, and we're so quick to do all this stuff, but I don't think about the heart or the motive and the intent that I'm doing it with. That makes sense? And we see it happen all the time out there on Facebook. Amen? All right, let me go, and I'm going to finish up. We're running out of time. I want to go deeper into this. How be it in vain they worship me, teaching for the doctrines of the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God. You hold the tradition of men as washing of pots and cups and other such like things. And you said unto them, full, full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. So he's saying, look right here, he said, you reject God's word in order to keep your own tradition. He's saying, you're rejecting this. And this is what he's saying. He's saying that they're blind that in all of their ability trying to show the world the light of Jesus Christ, what they're really doing is putting who he really is under a basket. Nobody can see Christ in him at all. Does that make sense? So he says, so what's happening is you're taking the word of God, the tradition, the word of God, you're doing away with it in order to hold up your tradition. And then he goes on, we'll get into this next Sunday. He goes on to saying, you're so quick. And then he goes into talking about the balance of love and justice. And Jesus even goes into it and says, you give one without the other, but you got to have them both. Boy, that's not the church we're in today. Amen, the world we're in today. So you and I, we've got to understand, okay, that we must let the sword cut me first. We must let the sword cut me. We must let the Word of God do the work on me first. Amen. And then once I yield the sword in my life, once I've allowed the Word of God to cut on me, once I've allowed the Word of God to dissect me, once I've been cut by the Word of God, now I can wield it with a whole different attitude to another person. Does that make sense? See, many of us, we're wanting to wield the sword on somebody else, but I'm not let that, I've not let it do the work in me yet. I've not let it cut on me. I've not let it cut out of me what I see needs to be cut out of you. Amen? So what happens is, is when I come across many, many, believe me, we, I know this, when I come across many, many times, that's what the double-edged sword is. That's what the speck and the log is, is that we got to look. We got to be willing. But then on the flip side of that, you can't just be so hard on yourself where you're not bringing forth what needs to be brought forth either. But when you do that, you got to make sure that your heart's right and still allowing yourself to be worked on by the same word. Does that make sense? It almost sounds like you're bipolar, but you're not. You know, so you go forth. So that's why he's saying, he's saying you're holding up the traditions of men, but really your heart's not far from me. And what does that mean? That they're so quick to point out what needs to be done in your life, but not willing to recognize what needs to be done in their own life. I don't ever want to come to somebody and notice the work that needs to be done there, 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 and neglecting the work that needs to be done in my own heart. That's the difference. That's the difference. And if we can learn to recognize the work that needs to be done in our own heart, that when I come to Ronnie and I talk to him about the work or John or Derek or Tony or whoever it is, 
Now I can come to him in a place of humility. Why? Because I'm not coming at him from a place of looking down, saying, hey, but now I'm coming to him in a place that's been cut by the same sword. Say, hey, brother, let me, let me explain something to you here. Let me try to help you out, man. You see the difference in the attitude? And, not, and I'm not exalting the tradition of men above. That's why Isaiah, when he went into the uh, throne room of God, he said, I am a man of unclean and broken lips. Why? Because he had been cut by the holiness of God in his own dirt and his own filth and his own wretchedness. And then when you recognize your own dirt, your own filth, and your own wretchedness, and then you recognize what Christ has done, now you have the boldness to proclaim that message to other people. Why? Because the very wretchedness that you found in yourself, you see the world, but the very cure you found in Christ, now you see that through him, and now you can deliver the fullness of the gospel message. Does that make sense? Amen? Let's stand up. I'm done.